All right, well, ladies and gentlemen, we came together today to talk about how we're going to better communicate. So I've got folks on this panel who have been in charge of or been involved in large communication plans. And we're going to let them discuss the plans that they were working on, its success, those things that didn't work so well, and what they're looking at for the future. All right, if you would, guys, just real quick, um, David, would you start and just introduce yourself, who you're with? Sure, absolutely. Uh, welcome. Uh, my name is David Godwin, and I'm the program and outreach coordinator for the Southern Fire Exchange. Uh, I work for the University of Florida as part of a program that's run by U University of Florida, Tall Timbers, and NC State, that's the Southern Fire Exchange, and I'm based uh, as a partner up here in Tallahassee at Tall Timbers Research Station. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Let it go. Amity. Uh, Amity Bass. I'm here representing the East Gulf Coastal Plains Joint Venture, but I'm an employee of Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries, and I kind of chaired the committee that came up with the communication strategy for the East Gulf Coastal Plains Joint Venture. Jim. Mark Melvin, and I'm employed by the Jones Ecological Research Center, just about an hour and a half. Uh, north of here and I'm here today even though I'm no longer uh, on the board I'm, I'm here representing the coalition of prescribed fire councils and I also want to take this time to uh, John Weir and John Siver they are two current board members so if we get uh, too hard of questions we'll defer to them <laughs> and Darryl? yeah I'm Daryl Jones I'm the forest protection chief for South Carolina Forestry Commission I'm the fire chief um, I was until last month. I was chair of our fire chiefs group uh, in the south, and um, chair of our prescribed fire council last year, and um, chair of the national wildfire coordinating group fire use subcommittee, which is the group that manages and maintains all the prescribed fire courses in the federal system. So, um, and I'll be talking mostly about the one message, many voices campaign that's been referenced already today. All right, well, Daryl, since you have the floor, why don't you continue? You want me to try to explain this real quick, then, huh? Real quick. <laughs> all right, so. <laughs> Uh, probably eight years ago or more, seven or eight years ago, uh, the fire chiefs from Georgia, Florida, and South Carolina, it was mostly one of those beer and napkin discussions at the beginning, but uh, we were all spending money on prescribed fire messaging, and the idea was that somebody could leave Miami on I-95 and ride up through Florida and go through Georgia and South Carolina and see the same common message about prescribed fire. That's really what we were trying to get. We were all doing it in a little bit different way and uh, weren't really sure how successful we were doing that or whether it was giving us the results we wanted. So we did the smart thing and hired people who knew more than us, Doc Cook will be one of those, to help us figure out how to deliver the message we wanted that prescribed fire is beneficial, that um, a little bit of smoke now is better than a lot of smoke later, all those kind of things that we all have talked about today. and. Basically, we contracted with him and some other folks to develop a message for us. Initially, as a three-state project, we applied for some funding, and it got funded as a region-wide project, so it extended to 13 states. Um, the message that came out was the visitbyforest.org site and goodfires.org that we've seen referenced earlier. And the, the idea, based on the social research, social science, and some intercept interviews and focus groups and uh, a lot of different ways of getting at it, was trying to figure out how to get the prescribed fire message in front of people and have them understand that carefully applied fire is a good thing, wildfire is not so good, right? Just to, to reaffirm that, um, what the data showed or what the social science showed was that people don't really care about fire and if you put anything about fire on a billboard, even if you say fire is awesome and there's somebody in a Nomex holding a torch, they all think it's bad and it's about arson. I mean, am I saying that correctly, Doc? That's, I mean, that's, that's absolutely correct. <laughs> if you mention fire or show fire, people automatically assume it's bad based on these intercept interviews. So we we changed our tactic dramatically because I sat there thinking of how many hundreds of thousands of dollars I'd spent doing just that, <laughs> and every state had, and uh, we realized that we were not doing it correctly, and we, we basically we were fire guys trying to deliver a message without any expertise in that field. So. What came out was visitmyforest.org, and the research showed basically that we need to get people 
to a website where they're getting something they want and while they're there give them the message we want them to see so you you really soft sell it and the website is set up if you haven't been you go there and you type in whether you want to hunt or fish or camp and you put in your zip code and say within 20 miles here's all the public lands you can hunt or camp or whatever while they're on that site there are messages very subtle messages there they don't show a lot of fire they show a healthy forest with burn scars and the research showed that people wanted a healthy forest that came up earlier today our tack on it was to say that those healthy forests don't happen by accident that prescribed fire is one way to keep them healthy and not to do a full frontal fire is awesome we're here to help kind of thing but to sell it to them in a different way so on the visit my forest site while they're getting their information there are messages about fire and if they click on that one of those other areas in there that says uh, this forest was maintained with prescribed fire click here to find out how click, click through that and you go to the good fire site so you, our job and the way we approached it was to get people to visit my forest they would follow through hopefully and go to good fires and once they do that they're engaged in the process they want to learn more and you can be a little more upfront with the message um, we've tried it different ways there were billboards we what we got from the contract was a set of uh, radio spots um, trans lights the lights on the bus stations um, bumper stickers billboards all the templates and the only difference between 13 states is which logo was on the bottom so we all had the same artwork the same graphics and everything um, so it's been done at movie theater trailers when you're watching the previews there would be a spot there in Louisiana I think that that a lot um, radio spots we did some of that and other states did billboards the bumper stickers uh, the, yeah, the other the other thing that I tried, um, we each state got the funding for the development, and we all got a little bit of money to initiate it, and we got three successive grants to total to help with that. I used our money to do online advertising. My rationale was we were trying to reach people who may live in the city and don't have any connection to the land. Um, they don't have a real tie to it, but they've got a four wheel drive truck and they want to know they can go off road. Right? That's kind of the. And as Doc explained to me. When you go to buy beer and milk at the store, it's in the back of the store, and you have to pass everything else to get there. They're wanting somewhere to go drive their full drive, and we give them the message on the way, and that's the same rationale. So I chose to go with the Weather Channel and now advertise online. I had $15,000 initially, and I got 8 million people to see the ads for $15,000. I mean, 8 million. So it was pretty impressive the amount of coverage you get from the money, and at that point, we. Uh, we were driving to visitmyforest.org, you know. The, the ad said things like it had a guy kicked back in a suit with his feet up on a desk in the middle of a burned forest. You know, healthy forest is what the message was. So people would click on that and that looks pretty cool and they go to the website and follow the process. We got a follow-on grant. Um, all told, I'll just sum it up, we had $265,000 spend and more than almost 21 million people saw those ads on weather.com. We chose weather.com because it has about 80% of the market share for weather. You can target it by zip code. You can limit it to just those states that you want or zip codes particularly that you want. Very good reporting. They give you a lot of data on who sees the ads, how many from how many saw it on our iPad, how many saw it on an iPhone, how many see it on a desktop computer. Very good data. Um, we just finished it in April. That ran out. We spent the last of the money then. So I don't have a lot of data on how successful it was overall, but I know that 20 million people got to see the ad. I don't know how many clicked through, and I don't know how long they spent on the site yet. I haven't gotten that far, but very large scale, trying to get those people that we don't have a connection to already to understand that fire is a benefit and helps healthy forests. So short, short summary. If there's anything I left no, out, no, you got it. Thank you. Better than right. I could. Thank there you very much. I think the, the big challenge that we had was uh, we did a lot of focus groups. We did them in all. We did them in. Three states. Three states, and we did intercept interviews. Not just, intercept interviews when you stand out in front of Kmart or Walmart, and you give somebody a, here's $5 for a pizza, take a look at this and tell me what you would tell your friend it is. And it was a logo or a, an image from, the, from one of the commercials, and you just get a very broad cross-section of people walking through the way you get some feedback. And it just, I, I know other data says otherwise, but the findings that we had was if they see an image of fire, that shuts it down at that point. They're not, they're not listening to what you're saying after that. So all of the, which would you rather have, the, this fire or this fire, 
They didn't see that. They just saw fire. And it is true. We had one billboard, no axe, drip torch, putting a line. And when we ask people what is it, oh, that's an arsonist. So, you know, it just, the testing is so critical to these. Yes, sir. Is there a way to go back with those 8 million and ever having people doing this and get feedback with a survey of the next number of maps to see if it, how much impact the results have had on them thinking about their behavior with fire? I don't think we could actually identify them. In, uh, yeah, they can identify the, if they can identify the IP addresses with the uh, computers and laptop and iPhone, it looks like they If you had the money, I'm sure you could find somebody who could parse the data and send that back out, but yeah. I think it would be an outrageously expensive process the, because that IP address for most of us is generated by your cable company, yeah. and it doesn't necessarily stay with you as your IP address. And the the other thing I, that this brought to light in the process of this, I I was kind of in the zone with my fellow fire chiefs, and we were doing good work for the will of the people, right? And, um, I put up a billboard. And 10 feet down the road, our state air quality agency had gotten money from an uh, air quality public health standpoint to put up billboards that said uh, outdoor burning is bad. And what they're referring to was <laughs> burning your trash, you know, and all that. So you have a billboard saying, uh, you know, burning is bad, and mine says fire is awesome, basically. And they were, they were 10 feet from each other. So what, what that led to was a better partnership with our air agency where we worked together to, to make one message you know, they actually supported some of our advertising. Um, they were very careful where they placed their ads. It was in problem areas. You know, I was placing in places where Tom Dooley burns because I get smoke complaints and, uh, you know, things like that. So it did lead to a lot of coordination, even though it was something that we had not intended at all. I think one of the big things that came out of this was the fact that we could bring all 13 states together and come up with a common definition of what's prescribed fire. How do you explain that to somebody who doesn't, they're, they're not listening to ecological imperatives. That's not something they want to hear. Just tell me, what is, what is prescribed fire? And you got nine seconds to tell me, because that's all I'm going to give you on television. And, and it, it came together and it worked, and it's still being used today. As I walk through my agency, I see it on several billboards that are, that are out there. So you can bring people together, you can form consensus, and you can't have a single message. We ran into a challenge with implementation. And that's due to several things, not the least of which was right after we finished the toolkit, the economy just kind of tanked. And it then became a question of, do I keep people or do I run your campaign? But which one am I going to do? I think well, certainly people made the, the, the resource decisions that they needed to, but the stuff is still on the shelf. The toolboxes are still there. <coughs> you could use tweaking, I'm sure, but that base is still there and the research is still there. And I'm hoping that it gets a chance to see the light of day at some point. All right. So, does anybody have any questions about that? Yes. Um, I was just wondering, as far as the, the materials that came out of the, the study, uh, did you do any intercept questions with, um, and focus groups and stuff like that on the material that was developed to see if the message did. was getting there? We did. Yes. And it, there was like three rounds of corrections in this thing before it actually, before it actually went out. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Yeah, so kind of maybe address uh, Mr. Saloon's question in a little bit of a way. I, I remember uh, four or five of the states did a uh, pre survey before it began this campaign. And, and then they did the survey a year or two after. And, and what were the results of that? They were just, I retired and gave you the results of surveys before and after. I'm going, to, I'm going to talk to the senior member of the team. Uh, those surveys out were done after, before and after the Chief Florida Statewide in 2004. When what we were using in the post was the effects of the statewide team, but it gave us a general look at what had it for about fire and we were moving that needle on prescribed fire which it should have work. But I don't know of any state that actually did a pre post for this project. Okay. I actually think there were three that did, Lane. They did? 
And uh, to answer Alan's question, I don't know what the results were, but we're at the point now where we've expended all the funding that we have. And what we owe the state foresters uh, is our committee, the fire group, working with the communications committee to summarize what this campaign accomplished and what all we spent and what the results were before we go for additional funding. So that's something that we, we should be coming out with fairly soon. Okay. Mark? Well, I don't know what all the solutions are. Uh, we were asked to, to, to share with you some of the things that we think work and, and some of the things maybe that we that aren't working that well or have not in the past. Uh, I do know fire is complicated. That much I know. Uh, communicating with the public is complicated. Uh, this much I know. I know that the problems that we face are greater than any one individual in here is going to resolve on their own. It's greater than any one agency or organization is going to accomplish. <clears throat> one of the things that I've been involved with um, in a very direct way uh, since about 2007 is the coalition of the prescribed fire councils. And, and fire councils are a successful model. Uh, Zach Prusak is not in this room, right? So I can say this probably to get away without saying this without opposition. That North Florida is the first prescribed fire council. Uh, I consider it to be the first modern. Uh, they came together in, in 1989 to really rally around prescribed fire related issues. Uh, there is a, the South Florida, it dates back to 1975, but it was uh, originally uh, created to address wildfire issues. But out of that, you know, that model was developed and refined. And then by the mid 2000s, there were six states uh, that had uh, developed prescribed fire councils, and they were fairly active. Four in the southeast, two in the Great Lakes. There was no cross-pollination uh, between any of the councils. And so there was an effort and an interest to see what could be done. Uh, and Lane was part of that original scoping group, as probably maybe some others in the room. But uh, anyway, out of that, what we realized was is that the state councils are very important because as we continue our discussions, I think we will, if we're honest, we'll, we'll realize that there are some differences within states, within regions, but fire implementation really comes down to local uh, places, local communities, uh, and local partnerships. But the fact is, is that the states, state agencies, typically forestry agencies, are the ones that manage fire. Uh, so you have 50 states doing fire 50 different ways. Uh, and, and that's okay. We, that's the world we live in. Uh, we're, we're not all going to be the same. And so the state model, that fire council, they can work within each state and be successful within that environment and the partnerships that, that are there. And one of the things that, uh, that all councils uh, that are effective do, and they do well, is they partner federal, state, and private interests. Uh, as has been mentioned through leaders' work and some other surveys, we know that most of the, the fire activity uh, in the U.S. occurs in the southeast. Uh, most of that occurs on private land. And so at that point in 2006, 7, when we were really uh, beginning to, to, to flesh out this idea, you know, that was the one voice that was, not, that was missing at the table. Uh, most of any national direction comes from the federal agencies. Uh, which public ownership is a little bit different. Uh, some of those policies and ideas come from regions that, even though Sarah says it's, 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 diff it's not different, they are different, uh, at least in the, in the policy realm. So uh, anyway, that all said, today we have uh, 31 councils in 27 states. All, I'm happy to say that all of the southeastern states, no matter how you look at drawing out the geographic boundary, all the southern states have an active prescribed fire council. Uh, and I think they support their states well. They support the region well. And, uh, and our primary focus is revolved around uh, developing those partnerships, becoming a big, a strong advocate for the fire, the prescribed fire use in that state, protecting the ability or the right to, to burn, 
and, and also promoting its use. So any communication piece that was developed, uh, I think you would find that the, all of the prescribed fire councils would be willing to, to adopt and, and contribute as best they can. Within the coalition network, the coalition really addresses uh, those national issues, and, and we can, I'd be glad to talk to you about any of them, but really there's about five, no matter, there are a lot of uh, dissimilarities, but there's a lot of similarities that we have, no matter uh, your property size or what state or region you're located in, there's some, some key issues, um, and so the coalition is, is interested in those, those national uh, kind of 30,000 foot level policy, uh, you know, we were uh, active in in all phases of the cohesive strategy, the development of that, um, we're networked through NWCG uh, and various committees, and uh, and try to stay at the pulse of what's going on, what's what's driving policy, and within each state council, um, we have a primary and a secondary contact, and so as things uh, arise, issues arise, emerge, information exchange. That's how that information is filtered back and forth is through those contacts and then it's the, up to the individual state councils to, to do, disseminate that through their membership. Uh, and that's, that's the model that we've had. As far as what, what really doesn't work, there's only two examples that I can think of, with, particularly with council startups. One uh, was uh, there was partnerships and there were uh, uh, an interest to start a fire council, but really didn't have the full support of the state agency uh, in that state, and so uh, that delayed the start and actually uh, had to, to reconvene and kind of come at it from a different angle, but, but that was resolved. The other council was uh, one that it was not all-inclusive. Uh, it, was, it was, the charge was, was uh, kind of dominated by one particular person and agency, and, and of course that, that was a failed attempt, uh, but it also later was resolved and now has a, as an active council. So uh, the advice there is, you know, just be inclusive. It's going to take partnerships. Uh, partnerships take work. It takes time in some cases to develop, uh, but, um, you know, you get far enough down the road and you can really see the successes and, and the benefits of working together. At some point, are you guys comfortable with bringing in somebody that does not necessarily agree with prescribed fire in the council or, or into your group? Oh, as as part of leadership? Well, as as at least part of you're hearing what they're saying, they they feel like they have some ownership in how decisions are being made. Um, yeah, and I would say I would say that there are some uh, and some of the the most at well actually the most active fire councils right now are currently in the West and they have they have a lot more issues with that and they have to address the public in a different way than yeah. than, than we do as the collectively as the Southeast. So some of that occurs. I've just not had that experience. Okay. Anybody have any question? Yes ma'am. I just have a comment. Um, so you <laughs> I, I, was, I would expect no less from that. Hey, I, and I'm going to speak to that. I was on the council in South Florida in 80, and it was not a prescribed fire council. It was an interagency wildfire council. It was not. It was not about prescribed fire at all. It was. It was not inclusive. It was. It was. It was an ex exclusive group of feds. <laughs> okay. Emily? Yeah. You have one more question. Um, I'm going to make a comment. Um, I'm Rick Hill, and I'm with the EPA, and um, I just was going to make a comment about one of the benefits of the prescribed fire councils. I think is that in a number of states, um, Georgia comes to mind, Florida, South Carolina, that um, they're instrumental in bringing together the air quality folks and the, and the fire folks. Um, I know in the Georgia one, I've been to their meetings a couple of times, and they always have uh, someone from the Environmental Protection Division to talk about the current air quality status. And it's, it's just helped to make the, the relationship better. Uh, 
somebody else. Yeah, no. but, but, uh, you go. Thanks. Uh, Mark, can you talk a little bit about how the different, uh, are there different models for the councils relative to their kind of mission and, and organization so that you, is this mostly a coordination and communications function that the councils do in the states or decision-making body? Uh, and, and if so, uh, do they uh, bring resources to the table and that sort of thing? Yeah. Um, generally, they, they all operate the same. You can look at the mission statements and there's three elements that will always be in place and that's uh, protect the right to burn, promote and educate. That's kind of, you know, and that's interwoven in, in, in all the, in, in, but everybody, everybody, just like the states want to be a little different, they want to have their own statement so it's, it, it reads a little different but those are the three focal points. Uh, all of them have some gut or some steering committee uh, most are volunteer organizations, so there's actually no money. It's just, you know, you collectively come to the table. What are the issues? You know, you can provide X, you can provide Z, I do Y, and we all come together and we work. Uh, there are some where, particularly in the states where they're trying to build capacity, and to do that they need funds. Uh, they can't do that as an ad hoc organization to, to write grants, so they become a 501c3. And so those have a board of directors. One of the, the downfalls of going that way, uh, but it, it works in some states, is that it basically eliminates the federal partners from your leadership because they can't, there's a conflict of interest and they can't participate. Uh, but there are some workarounds in, in that regard. But that allows them to uh, apply for and get grant money where they can actually turn it around and get, provide it back to the landowner in, in uh, assistance for burning, actual, you know, getting fire on the ground. So, uh, you know, that's, there's only a handful, maybe, it's through, I, I wish I could tell you exactly, maybe three or four. Any in the southeast? Uh, is Mississippi, anybody from Mississippi? Seems like Mississippi was trying to to be a 501c3. I mean, I mean Alabama. Since, they talked about it. I'm not sure what. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Alabama is one of the most important. Well, it's not a question. It's a response to your question, which I was trying to think of how we were uh, trying to keep people out that didn't agree with us. And when Rich spoke of it, it reminded me. That uh, when we thought EPA was trying to shut us down, then uh, there was quite a debate in the Georgia and the Florida Fire Council about whether or not we should invite these folks to get amongst us and find out our secrets. <laughs> but Georgia broke the ice, Rick came to that meeting, it just went swimmingly, and then the North Florida Council was fighting in the government. So we did a great job of bridging the gap. Thank you. All right. Now, all right, um, so I did make a short presentation um, just to kind of talk about this strategy. This strategy, um, it's a communication strategy of the East Gulf Coastal Plain Joint Venture, um, but it is not intended to just be for the JV or just to be for projects within the JV boundary. We really wanted it to be something that could be applied to the southeast as a whole on all fire-dependent habitats. So, um, so don't think just because it says joint venture that it's just restricted to birds or it's just within that geography. We want it, we want it to be for for everybody. So this is a plan that we uh, is not going, Jennifer. Errors lower. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, so just to say who was on this team, um, who developed it: Rob Holbrook, myself, uh, Mike Black, who's now at the Short Leaf Initiative. Uh, Adam Butler with Mississippi Parks, Vernon Compton with Longleaf Alliance, Tim Mersman with the Forest Service, and then of course we're a bunch of biologists and foresters so we hired a communication specialist, Greg Elliott, to really help us to, to put this together. And what Greg did is that she interviewed 45 prescribed fire experts in the southeast, many of which are here, um, and then based on that we developed this plan. 
And we finished the plan late last year, so it's, it's really kind of new, and so we're just kind of getting the word out about it and, and wanting for people to see what's in it and, and hopefully for people to work with us or, or take it up yourself and start trying to accomplish some of these goals that are in this plan. So we have policy goals, we have outreach goals, and we have education goals. And so within this document, there's actually 30 messages. And so the way that we have them set up is I have a couple of examples. So one message is, you know, showing that prescribed fire um, benefits the prevention of wildfires. And so we have some examples of that, how you can do cost-benefit analysis to show how, you know, there's, there was a wildfire near Orlando that cost $32,000 and it took six days to put out. However, if they would have done prescribed burning, it would have only cost $7,000 for one day. So, so things like that, getting information out about how, you know, these things, are, prescribed burning is beneficial and it's economically valuable. And then we, then we put what the audience is. These are the, this is the audience that you should be going to, to to talk about these kind of things. Another one is every state should have the right to burn, and that audience should be state legislatures and county governments. So you can kind of go through this document, pick up a message, and then we'll have a discussion about it, what you should say, and then who, who is the appropriate audience to address this with. And then one more we had, uh, and that's something we've talked about today, how we need to increase the number of burn days. Well, we need to change the smoke dispersion requirements, seasonality of burning, and also improve models for predicting smoke behavior. And then who do you speak to about that? Well, the air quality and forestry agencies are the most appropriate entities to deal with. So throughout this whole document, we have these kind of things. Here's the message. Here's the intended audience. Here's some discussion on that, things that you can take up and, and kind of run with. <coughs> and, uh, and then also, if you go to our website, you can download the whole plan. And then we also have an executive summary where you can just click on the area of interest and it will take you right to it. But yeah, the, basically the, the reason that I'm here is to let people know we have this plan. It's for the Southeast as a whole. And it's something that the joint venture can accomplish some things within it ourselves. But really it's something that we want to work with partners and kind of do a more large scale um, good things for fire and, and these fire dependent habitats. So that's it. Any questions, Brian? All right. David? All right, well, thank you. Uh, with the Southern Fire Exchange, I think we're maybe a little bit different from some of the other groups here in this room. Uh, we're not necessarily out here to increase the number of acres burned in the Southeast. Our role uh, is to provide access to the science for natural resource managers uh, so that they can use the latest science and research in the management of their ecosystems or, or their areas. So uh, we are a science outreach and communication program, essentially. And we work across 13 states in the southeastern U.S. Uh, we have a small uh, key group that works within our organization. We're not part of a larger uh, agency. We don't have those kinds of resources. We're a small program. Um, and really, our goal is to synthesize and promote access uh, and the use of relevant science in the management of southeastern U.S. ecosystems. Um, so in that regards, uh, you know, our end metric is not necessarily uh, more acres burned in the southeast. But at the same time, uh, what we would like to see is, you know, increased use of the latest research so that the managers are, are basing their uh, management decisions. And those managers, keep in mind, too, that could be folks uh, with 40 acres, with 200 acres of private land, 3,000 acres of private land. That could be folks who are managing uh, TNC or NGO properties. That could be folks who are managers uh, for, you know, local, state, federal. All of those folks are what, who we consider our stakeholders. Um, that's who we're trying to support in terms of increasing access to fire science materials. So we'd like to see that those folks are using the latest science when they're making their management decisions, including the public. Uh, so with that in mind, you know, we have a small program. We don't have a lot of staff. We've been, we've really, I think, successfully uh, worked with partners across the Southeast who have similar missions, maybe a little more targeted, whether it increase the amount of long leaf across the Southeast, uh, increase burning um, all over the Southeast. So we partner with folks like Long Leaf Alive. The, the local implementation teams uh, have been partners for us, and the prescribed fire councils. Uh, so we're, we're, we're able to see that we can support their efforts, which are a little more nuanced or focused 
Uh, we can also say, hey, we have opportunities and we have some resources that might be able to um, help the management decisions of, of your folks, your stakeholders as well. Uh, so, you know, given that, um, the kinds of things that we do uh, and the kinds of programs we work on, we're kind of, it's a range. We don't have a lot of uh, resources, a lot of staff, um, but what we've seen is, you know, there's definitely value, and Sarah talked about that uh, this morning, in, in getting folks into the field uh, and learning about management and um, learning about the latest science in the field. And so we work together to partner on workshops across the southeast. Um, and there's there's a lot of value in that. Uh, but then, you know, a few years ago, and, and we're still seeing it now, there's clearly uh, limitations on travel, especially for our agency partners, but for private landowners as well. Um, so we've spent uh, quite a bit of effort on communication programs, outreach programs tied to webinars. Uh, because when we do it, that's one thing, another tangent I'll go on to, surveys. We do a lot of surveys. Um, SFE, I say, if we haven't surveyed you yet, just wait. <laughs> We're going to survey you. And, you know, if you sit still long enough, you might get another one, especially if you come back to a PFC meeting. Um, and I, I think we use surveys to help guide our decision-making process because that gives us a sense of what managers are having issues with. What are the science questions that managers are coming up with? What are their knowledge, what kind of needs do they have? Um, and that at the same time, being an organization that kind of that works on that boundary between management and science, we're then able to take some of those uh, needs that we receive from surveys and communicate with our researcher partners and say, hey, you know, this, these are the problems that our managers across the southeast are, are facing on their lands. And we can say, okay, you know, we've surveyed them at PFC meetings, and so we know, you know, these are private landowners who are having issues with this. Or these are private landowners, these are folks who are working with agencies, these are uh, nonprofit, these are TNC folks. They're all having issues with smoke. And we can, then we then have opportunities because we're funded by a joint fire science program, which is a federal fire science agency. Every once in a while, we've had the opportunity to kick those needs back up to them to help influence their decisions and to make, provide opportunities to suggest to them, hey, when you're funding research at the federal level that's going down to these research organizations or universities, these are the needs that managers in our region are having. Um, and I think that's one thing that we, you know, it's getting off on tangent a little bit, but that's one thing that one role that SFB tries to provide in the Southeast, and that's one of the reasons we might survey uh, a lot. Maybe too much sometimes. Um, webinars, like I said, was one area that we've really focused uh, on in the southeast because it allows us to get managers and researchers together. We can have a researcher come in. We had uh, just this past spring Jim Cox from over here at Tall Timbers. He is a renowned fire and upland bird researcher. He's an expert. And he came in and gave us a, a webinar. We were able to have 130 folks online that day, managers from all over the southeast and folks from on this side of the country as well. They knew about him and learn about some of his latest research in the use of prescribed fire for managing upland ecosystems for various bird species. And this is, you know, this is putting folks who are on the ground making these management decisions, writing these burn plans in contact with the guy who's coming up with the latest research in the cutting edge knowledge about how to better manage those ecosystems. Um, so we've worked webinars uh, for the past two, three years, and in, in all we've been able to pull in over about 2,000 people in participation uh, for those different events. And then of course they're archived, people can watch them later on. Um, I'm not going to go too long on that, but one thing I think I want to hit on as a lesson that we've learned a little bit, just kind of a small micro lesson, but it has an impact. Um, we do a lot of surveys, uh, and, and y'all talked a little bit this morning about uh, capturing information on these direct mails and that sort of thing. Anytime somebody uh, registers for one of our events, we capture a little bit of information about them. So we know, you know who, who are the folks that are going to be attending our field workshop. We do online registration through Eventbrite. Have y'all used Eventbrite before? I highly recommend it. It's a good uh, data collection tool handling registrations. You can collect some information about who's coming to your field workshop or your webinar, and then you know, all right, manager, manager, private landowner, 
private land or consultant, all right, and you know maybe they're not all from Florida. Every once in a while, just because you have a workshop in Florida, we have folks driving over from Alabama too or Georgia. You get a little bit of information about those folks. Then we'll do a post survey after the event's over, quick, you know, not too long. But then we capture a little bit of information about what they thought about the event that day. Not just what they thought about it, but what didn't we capture? What did we not touch on so that we know next time around where we need to focus our, our efforts on? What should our next webinar be or what should, uh, what should that researcher know the next time he gives a presentation to another group? What does he need to kind of focus on? Um, and at, at the same time, in all of these, we kind of provide an option, op opportunity for folks to, to join our email list. Because that email list, like you said, is, is a pretty valuable tool. Yeah. So, uh, I got a minute? No, sure. Okay. Uh, one thing we've learned, you know, somebody hit on earlier about uh, social media. You know, we kind of, we had a lot of pressure early on to, to develop social media programs and, and to really invest time in our program. And, you know, we don't have a lot of people, it was me, <laughs> to spend time on, uh, you know, Twitter and Facebook and all that sort of thing. Um, and through all of our surveys, and we started asking people, you know, you came to our workshop, you came to our webinar, you joined our email server, or we met you at a, a prescribed fire council meeting, and we caught you the survey there. You know, how did you find out about this event? How did you learn about this? <clears throat> and you know, this is kind of, it, there was some research that came from our, our uh, joint fire science program, kind of next level up. They were trying to find out how are people finding out their fire science information uh, at the national level and also at the regional level. And what we saw kind of matched up with what they saw was that social media was not necessarily increasing participation in our activities. Um, and it didn't really seem to matter how much time we invested in those social media programs. That wasn't driving folks uh, to interact with us, to get the kinds of information, and to use that information in their, uh, in their decision making process. So we we really scaled back social media quite a bit. Um, we still have a presence on those social media programs, but we don't invest the amount of time that we once did. What the, our research in-house and then our own um, research has come down from, from the national organization of the, of the uh, uh, Fire Exchange Network. We're just a regional program of a, a nationwide group that does fire science communication outreach, and each part of the country has a similar program like the Southern Fire Exchange. What their uh, study showed was that email was a really was one of the most powerful tools um, for communicating and for driving folks. In that that um, having access to that via email uh, made a bigger difference in things like all sorts of social media. So that's one thing that we've learned along the way. Uh, we've really scaled back. Focus on email. Okay, any questions? Let's talk about email for a minute. Uh, we all don't want to get into the level of being spammed. You don't want to be the, the guy that's automatically sent to the sent to the delete side. So part of this is cautious, careful, don't overwhelm people, and then get them to opt in. At least in Florida, that's a requirement for state agencies that they opt in. We actually have a double opt-in where, yes, I want it, and then they get sent an email. You said you wanted it. Did you really, really want it? You have to check there. But I, I think um, I, I tell people all the time, the system that we're using at FWC, I can talk to one out of every 23 people in the state of Florida directly to them. And I probably know more about them as far as what are they interested in, where do they live, what sort of things that they asked for the last time. We use a system called GovDeliver. I don't know if you guys have seen it, but it's just an email system where you subscribe and then you can, I'm interested in these things, I live in this area, and our promise to them is that we won't send you anything unless you ask for it. And that takes discipline. Because I've got a million names. And I, I can't tell you how many times people have come to me and said, can you just send this out to everybody? No can't do that. We've done it, okay? Sometimes it comes from a place where you say, absolutely, no problem. But then we track how many people unsubscribe after that, and it's a huge number. We've had it up to as large as 30 and 40,000 people now. I'm dealing with a million, with an with a, a email base of a million, but to watch that 30 or 40,000 drop out 
when it was hard to get them in there, you formed a covenant with people as far as email is concerned. Make sure you send them what they're asking for when they ask for it. Um, and, you know, social media is a lot like billboards. Um, if you have a campaign that's just a billboard, nobody's going to recognize it. You have an image up there, people are going to look at it for two or three seconds. That billboard can act as a reinforcement of your brand, of your message, or whatever. Social media can act as that reinforcement of your brand and of your message. But it can't be the only place. What is going on, though, and, and, sometimes, and, and state agencies in particular, I think, have picked up on this, there is a conversation going on in the world about you. And you have a choice. You can be part of that conversation, or you can let other people speak for you. And that's what social media really is. The, the idea that, um, you know, it used to be we would hold a press conference when something happened, and we'd set the time and the place, and, and we'd give out the information, and the media would write the stories, and they'd put it out. Well, we learn about it from somebody who's out on the street who Twitter is the bear ate the person, you know, and, and then it comes down from there. So the, the time cycle is much, much faster. You have to be able to respond to those things from, from an agency perspective and from an NGO perspective also if you're involved in that sort of thing. Um, but it's no longer a case of, and I'm glad to hear that you're there, you're just not spending as much time because if you don't have that presence, if there isn't somebody that looks to see wow, we've gotten 14 comments about this thing. We might want to set the record straight and tell them what's really going on, rather than let this rumor just increase and go on from there. So just kind of keep in mind, it may not drive people to your web page, but it can very easily become what was a thorn in your side to being a whole hair-on-fire crisis if you just let these rumors continue or you, or you don't answer in a reasonable amount of time, the questions that are coming to you. People look at it as a conversation that they're having with you, and they expect to hear back. Okay, so the question that I'd like to pose to you guys is, what is it that you think would be, I mean, this is the Blue Sky Committee. You can have anything that you want. What is it that you think would be the most effective single element that you don't have now to get more burning on the ground? What is that one thing that you sit around and go, if we only had, and money is probably one of them, but what, what is that thing that you feel that you're missing more than anything else to accomplish your goal? Capacity. I mean, we need Capacity. To people to do it. So. Okay. Is this something that you can bring volunteers into? No. I disagree. Okay. I think you can bring volunteers into it, but it's going to take a lot of time up front <coughs> to that they are valuable to you. But I ran a lot of fires with I was the only person being paid. So it can be done, but it's a lot of, you have to, it's a big commitment. It's also a constant commitment because it's there's a constant, a constant turnover on people. Yeah. Okay. You know, at the, um, at the University of Florida, they have a program, a club, called the Student Association for Fire Ecology. And it has students um, that come from the forestry program, the wildlife program. And they are often quite eager to go volunteer on birds, uh, especially in the Gainesville area. And they're doing that for free to gain experience. Uh, and, it's, and it provides them an opportunity to go out gain fire experience on the ground and, and that organization's been around for, for several years. It's had turnover, but, mm -hmm. but there are students that are actively looking to participate in burns so they can um, work towards their own fire qualifications. Okay. I, I think I think there's a lot of ways to look at that, but um, it's a little bit I don't want to say troubling to me, but it, it kind of stood out to me um, this morning that People are not willing to do these practices without money, you know, and I think that's kind of the wrong model. If we're always dependent on that money, then the burning is not going to be sustainable. And what we need to do is get the landowners where I come from. I, I did my first prescribed burn when I was six years old. My granddad gave me a burn. A burn, yes. <laughs> my granddad gave me a, a burning pine top, and he said, walk that way and don't tell your mama. And that's how it happened. And, uh, 
<laughs> and I've been burning ever since. And I, I'm not the one we need to reach, and you guys are not. It's the landowners that that own the land, and they need to be, we need to get them to the point where they can do a lot more of the burning. At least in, in my state, landowners doing 76% of the acres on private lands. 76% of the acres burned are done by private landowners on private lands. Themselves, oh, themselves driving the torch, dragging the torch. Landowners carrying the torch. So those are the people, if I want to increase acres mm -hmm. burn, it's, I can add 10 people and burn a few more acres, but I'm not going to get to my goal of burning twice the acres I am now by agency people doing it. We need to be there to facilitate those private landowners getting the confidence and, and education training to do it. So, you know, make sure that you're targeting the right group is a big key to all of this with the capacity, I really think. Okay. Yes. So why not set up a mentoring program for landowners to landowners? be able to do that and then the, on the other side of that in each county or each region find a burn calendar where the landowners who are wanting to have somebody someone come help and be the mentor put their burning days their progressive their burning days even if it's a day ahead of time on the calendar so people can access that and then uh, show up and that that's exactly what we've been trying to do I, you know I've got there's a landowner I know that owns 15,000 acres and he's he came to our certification class and he said I'll take anybody I'll work them like a whip mule <laughs> and they can carry a torch until they feel comfortable I feel comfortable with them I'll let them write a plan on my property and I'll stand there with them and and until then they can drag a torch and coordinating that and bringing that together is, it's a struggle and there's some issues but we're that's what we're trying to exactly try to do is do a mentoring program and share that because it, it is somewhat difficult for me to take a private landowner and put a torch in their hand on a burn that i'm doing right so th that's that's exactly where we are that's right that's right yes ma'am um, about this idea for a mentor and mentor program. And we have a, a model in our Midwest area that works very, very well. And it was about cover crop champions. Um, we call it crop champions. It was landowners that we were able to provide small grants to. It kind of comes back to the whole money thing. A lot of have jobs and, and time is a problem. And finding an incentive to ask the landowner not only to burn their property, but then to kind of step up and be this mentor or, um, you know, to take this role of mentoring others about a practice that they want to promote. And, and our model, just, just for brief thought, for the cover crops in the Midwest was providing these landowners small grants to cover their, their time, their travel, to, to go and promote them from the media. And that model worked very, very well. And again, it, it took money. It took actually funding a landowner to stand up. And, and we knew that they were doing something successfully and they were having great benefits and that program has been hugely successful in, in um, increasing the amount of cover crops in that area because landowners want to trust somebody and they don't always know who to trust. We know they trust other landowners that are doing it and they can go see it. Um, so that's a model that you know, Jen and Tom and Salem and I have been floating around and we're kind of referring to a good bit and if anyone has any ideas of how we could you know, get this thing off the ground, I'd be all year. It's going to come down to, of course, funding, of course, but um, it's a program that that is land and land are in, in kind of different in theory. We're hoping we can do something. So I would love to chat more about that either. Well, the, in yep. spring or here. <clears throat> well, the other thing I've, I've realized tied to that is it has taken me a long time to get my head out of this, but you know, I was taught all through school to burn this time of year and accomplish this and breaking down the mold and expanding your burn window. I, I pulled the data before I left. There have been 11 days in South Carolina in the last five years where we didn't take at least one notification for a prescribed burn. 11 days in five years. And that tells me there are opportunities all year to burn something in some fashion. And to, if we limit it to the burn season, February, March, April, or whatever we pick is that, then you're limiting the amount of time you can get those things done. So that's, that's something I've had to really explain and beg or command or whatever people that work for me to, to think outside of that because that, that really boxes yourself in and limits what you can accomplish. So tell the non-biologist why you were limited before. What was it that caused you? Culture. To okay. <laughs> Mostly culture and, and uh, that's what it this is. This is when we burn? Yep. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, 
I just want to add a comment. I think that we really need to look at this on a state by state and demographics and regional basis because Daryl, you know, areas like that where sailing works, you have that firm culture. But in the initiative I had, the short leaf pine, in those 22 states, we have lost that culture. In a lot of states, not just with the private landowners, but the state agencies and federal agencies. So what I'm saying is, like Jim Carroll mentioned earlier, some of his points he wanted to address the group with, maintain your base. Let's not ever lose that culture in the coastal plain. We need to put our emphasis there first. But these states to the north and east and west are going to need our help and guidance to try to restore that burn culture back because we lost it in a lot of those areas. So, you know, it's I, I look at envy, at envy with what Daryl has, but I also realize that there's a lot of states that are not at this summit sure. because there's nobody there that would represent that state at this meeting. And I know in Tennessee, in my own state, I dare say less than 1% of the private lands are burned by private landowners. If we don't have capacity, we don't have funding for those individuals, in some of those states, we won't get that job done. I want to say, we're all on the same trail. Mentoring is under capacity. You want to crack that nut, which is a huge nut. And again, this is just a suggestion. You know, somebody's got a pro up on the table. And we know it takes capital. I would like to see the NRCS, <clears throat> and I'm just lagging the number. I think they used to do this. To become a certified burn man, it's going to cost that. You know, for the sign for the course, spend four days of your life, whatever. I'd like to see him say, you know what? I would cost share with you as an individual landlord. I need to buy a grain, but within two years, here's your delivery. You have to become a certified partner. You got to go, I don't give a crap where you got to go get on five or And here's some financial incentive to go find these folks. Because we're all close, but there's different ways to get there. But again, it's got to take capital. And if the NRCS can cost you, we put some money behind it, give somebody, say, two years to get certified, you know, four days is a big commitment. Mm -hmm. A couple hundred bucks for registration, meals, motels, having to travel, you know, somewhere part of the state. And then beyond that, okay, now you've got them certified. You've got their uh, intelligence factor. You know, have an opportunity to give a lot of higher knowledge. Then the next thing is like now they're all greens. They just got to find some place to go. And they can find guys like Salem. However, they got a period of time to financially to get them get back. So to me, it's all about money's got to be part of it. And I think the NRCS farm bill, I just would really like to see. And when people say we can't do it, well, who makes the rules? Well, they we just change the rules and get out of it. But we the same discussion as we let me, let me ask a logistical question. Um, in, the, in the certified burn class, is there a classroom and then field work? Just a classroom. Just a classroom. Could it be, could it be, could it be done online? Most, most have an element of experience that is beyond the classroom. I think the real challenge here is, at least in my opinion, uh, and for those that know me, this probably is not worth a whole lot, but uh, is this capacity issue is real. It's real in all 50 states. How we overcome it, I don't know. We can take people and we can teach them online. We can bring them into settings like this and we can teach them. It's just like the 16-year-old kid that takes the driver's permit, you know, to get his license. We can teach him the rules of the road. But you can't give that 16-year-old kid the keys to the car that he's never driven. And fire is the same way. It's a learned experience. How we, how we ensure that those new or, uh, practitioners are getting that experience, you know, I'm sure there's lots of ways. I think if this is really something that we want to tackle, we need to back out a little bit and say, okay, this is the issue. Capacity is an issue. You know, moving forward, we all need to agree that the new practitioner needs to look like this. It's going to take this many hours in the classroom. They need to have these elements taught to them. They need this much experience. It's going to take this much time. Uh, that's just a, just a thought. One, one quick add on, because I've said this before. And the only thing you have to be careful with, don't turn this into some NWCG. Now you got to have 130, 190, 490, you got to pay them. No, that's all I have to kill it for private land. 
I'm all about safety and PPE, but as you go forward, let's not layer up too much stuff that you actually, now you really kill the deal. Like saying, oh, now you got to, you know, be a high two firefighter and hard to I mean, where do you draw the line? And I think that's just a slippery slope that it's easy for state and fed to get on to shove that down. Shove this down, people struggle. It's like, that doesn't change it. If you want to kill it, just make them look like a better rally or state. That's not what you need to go. Give them the training, give them the experience. And RPPE, but don't, don't go too far. I could be to you just a second. Yes, sir. Uh, a couple of speakers talked about the weather parameters restricting the amount of burning that's that not be allowed to go on. Remember, Lita talked about how many burning days were available in the state of Florida County and how many acres they would have to burn. Uh, to get that burning done, and uh, I would only tell me, I'm not sure if I'm right about this or not. It might just be really wild, but most of the weather parameters that we go by on burning are in documents that were published uh, through research. Uh, the old guy for prescribed burning in the South, you know, written by Dale Lake, just about all of us know that, and we write our burn plans based on those weather parameters. and. So all that was written in a different time and place. Uh, back when, when those research was done and those documents were written, we had all kinds of issues uh, with prescribed burning and all kinds of attacks on burning, you know, all the way from folks trying to outlaw burning because of wrecks on the highway. Well, prescribed burning has come a pretty good ways since all those weather parameters were suggested in the literature. I'm wondering if we're not still using those old weather parameters that were published in a different time and place. And, and maybe if we should look at what kind of weather parameters we could use now, and could those be expanded a little bit? With due caution, we don't want to go back to where we were in the 70s. But it, it could be we're restricting ourselves by using weather parameters that, that were researched and written uh, 30 years ago. Things might be different now. And the last question. John Stein has been killing me for this, and this is not well thought out. <laughs> However, I just posed this as a question and to be thought out a little bit better than what I'm thinking out. Why not incorporate a mentor program in your burn certification courses so that once the certification course is done, then that that certified bird manager potential to, fight, to get the final certificate is to do a couple burns with a mentor. Okay, we'll be out the part, Michael. We won't go fix that. A lot of legal reasons is important. Yeah. Well. Um, raise your hand for me. Okay, very good. All right. Um, thank you very much, everybody. I think it was, a, it was a good panel. We had some really good discussion. And